So this week we have another special guest for you. We have John Connolly. John first founded the Institute for Survivors of Sexual Violence, a non-profit organization engaged in research and development of cutting edge treatment for survivors of trauma. His early career experiences as a child protective service worker and clinical supervisor in a program for traumatized teens helped shape the creation of rapid resolution therapy. John is the author of Life Changing Conversations with Rapid Resolution Therapy, a book demonstrating that a single conversation can dramatically improve one's life. He recently published another book, Grief is Not Sacred, demonstrating how grief can be resolved in a single meeting. He also developed innovative training programs designed to teach rapid resolution therapy to people looking to relieve suffering. Doctors, dentists, mental health professionals, teachers, coaches, nutritionists, lawyers, caregivers, nurses, business owners, and others have become rapid resolution therapy members with the intention to learn and apply the fundamentals of rapid resolution therapy to themselves and their field. John Connolly is licensed as a clinical social worker and holds a doctorate in clinical pastoral counseling. It's now time to tune into this one very inspirational human being. Enjoy. So today I am super excited about our guest. We have John Conley and um, and I'm pro- pronouncing it probably a little bit differently because I don't have the accent, but welcome to the show, John. It's wonderful to be with you, Catherine. I've been so looking forward to it. Me too. I can't wait to get into it. So the way that we start the show, we always love to ask our guest to share their story. So John, tell us what inspired you to do what you do today? So I, um, I got out of college with a degree in history. Um, I, I was not a good learner. It was hard. It was a struggle. I had to promise the physics teacher I would mop his floor if he would give me a D. Um, a, a true story. I mopped the floor to get a D. Uh, and that way I got out of college. And then I'm finally out of college with a degree in history. And so I'm ready to rock and roll. I'm ready to work. And I started looking through the want ads for, you know, somebody, they want a historian with a bachelor's degree. There's nobody wants a historian with a bachelor's degree. So I, I'm looking and looking. There are all these jobs like being a welder, where you have to know how to weld, or do this, you have to know how to do this. I sat there and realized I finished four years of education, Catherine, I didn't know how to do a damn thing. I called my grandfather. He said, how are you doing, Johnny? I said, oh, I'm pretty depressed. And he said, what's the matter? And I said, I have a college degree. And he said, and that's depressing you? And I said, oh, yeah. I said, I can't do anything. I, I can't do a thing. And I've got a college degree, and I feel like life is kind of over. And he said, well, what did you do in college? And I said, well, I wrote a few papers and took a lot of tests. He said, did you, did you pass the tests? I said, most of them. And he said, well, here's where to go. And he gave me an address. And I went to this building, and it was a civil service building where you could test for government jobs. And I just started taking tests. And then I got a job. And the job was that I was supposed to protect abused and neglected children, which I had zero experience with, Catherine. Before I got the job, I didn't know there was such a job. Uh, so that's, that's how I got started. And so for our viewers and our listeners, let's unpack exactly what you do. Let's talk about rapid resolution therapy. What is it exactly? Well, um, I I went to psychotherapy school and um, I, I tried to apply that. And um, I, 
I, I just, I tried, I really tried. Um, and it, it didn't seem to make sense. I, I remember I, I was concerned about trauma because I began as a child protective service worker. So there I am knocking on doors saying, hey, I'd like to come in and chat with you and your daughter a little bit. Somebody thinks you're kind of messing around with her. Um, and I thought we'd have a heart to heart, the scariest freaking job in the in the whole world to me. I, I would drive around the block four times until I work up the courage to go knock on the door and, and say things like that. And, and so I did that for a number of years. Then I um, uh, got another job working with runaway, throwaway teenagers in a short-term residential facility. So early job protective, I mean, I'm really exposed to trauma. And then I'm exposed to kind of older kids who ran away, most of them. And, you know, you don't want to see kids run away and live on the street. But for these kids, it was probably the best thing they ever did because they ran away from stuff that was so horrendous. And I got to really notice what can happen to people and how what can happen to them can be um, causing them to then later be um, troubled. And I remember calling up a, a friend from um, a graduate school and say, uh, I'm having these people, well, after I got into practice, uh, I said, these people are coming in telling me I've been traumatized and stuff. And I think I slept through all the classes on that. What, did, can, did you stay awake? Can you give me the notes? And he said, John, they didn't have any classes on that. And I said, well, what the heck am I supposed to do? Uh, uh, he says, well, you're supposed to go to postdoctoral programs. So I went to a postdoctoral program and that started to make sense. They told me, that the reason people continue to be troubled about things that happened that were bad was because when they were happening, they didn't have time to feel and express their feelings. That makes sense. I mean, if somebody's getting raped, they're, but they're focused on not being dead, not on getting in touch with and expressing feelings. So they told me the problem people are having is that feelings got stuck in them. And it was my job to try to get the feelings out of them. And, and they told me I was supposed to provide what they called a safe place and cause people to re-experience the worst moments of their life as powerfully as possible. I was told if I got people screaming, sobbing, crying, that was good. But they gave me a bucket and said, if you get them to vomit, it's better. I hated it, but I did it because I figured... I didn't protect the children the way I should have. I didn't protect the teenagers the way I should have. I was a walking mess of guilt. So I said, I hate this job, therefore I should do it. And I, <laughs> I did it and did it and did it until I realized what I was doing, I didn't think was working. And if anybody got better, I figured it was in spite of me. I, I remember going to my therapist and, 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 and I said, I've realized the meaning. I understand my purpose. I know who I am. And he said, well, finally, what did you figure out? I said, I am a roadblock on the way to mental health. I am the thing when somebody finally gets it together and wants to do something to make themselves better and get their minds working, then they unfortunately for them end up with me. Uh, that's where the thing, that's where the thing ends. So, so that's where I was going and, and, and I didn't know what I was doing, and I um, I took a I took a three day course in hypnosis with some guy who used to do stage shows, um, and and then I said, well, this makes a little bit of sense, not much, but you know, they basically said, you're relaxed, you're relaxed, you're relaxed, you feel confident, don't smoke or something. And so I figured, I guess I can do that. You're relaxed, you're relaxed, don't smoke. And, and there I was, and I, I'm in practice for two days as a hypnotist. And this lovely young lady comes in and I said, what can I do for you? You must want to stop smoking because you're trim and beautiful. So you're not here to lose weight. She said, no, I was raped. And I said, oh, man. 
um, well, what should I know? And she says, I don't know who raped me. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I can't tell you whether the person was white or black, old or young, fat or thin. I don't know any of them. And, and she's so freaked by the whole thing that, that she didn't know it, Catherine. And it was troubling her, one, because it made her feel like an idiot with police saying, well, tell me about the guy who raped you. Well, how would I know about the guy? Who, well, he got pretty close, didn't he? Tell me something. I don't remember anything. But more significantly was she couldn't ascertain her own safety. Imagine how awful that is. She couldn't look around the room and know the rapist wasn't in it. So I didn't really know what I was doing. But I, 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 I said, um, I said, hey, can I make a recording? We used to have these things called tape recorders. You probably saw them in yeah, the museum. Yeah, I remember those. <laughs> and she said, yeah, I'd like that. And I put on this little tape and put it going and did what came to mind to do. Um, and, and it seemed to work. I mean, it seemed to really work. And the next day I got a call from this detective. He says, hey, you hypnotized? One of my rape victims? I, I, uh, detectives make me nervous. I was always nervous around cops. I said, yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Sergeant, sir. <laughs> I, I, I did. And he says, and you recorded it? I said, well, yes, I did. And he said, well, give me the tape. And I said, well, I have it right here. And he said, I'll be right over. And he came and grabbed this little recorded tape from me, called me the next day, and he said, I don't know what you're up to, dude. I mean, this is really scary. I don't know what you're up to. He said, but I had the worst crime victim ever. She's completely freaked and she doesn't know anything. And now she's calm, clear, co collected. And I've never heard so much detail. He says, this guy is raping people all over the place. Will you see some of the other victims, I said, it would be my honor. All of a sudden, my office, I mean, I, I grew up scared to death of cops. My office has got police and detectives and sex crime unit and FBI agents and this victim and that victim, they kept getting more and more um, uh, harmed. This gal was emotionally harmed, but there wasn't any physical damage. I started seeing people with black eyes, broken arms, and this got worse and worse. Thank goodness they caught him and the lovely detective, and I still even remember his name, Detective Lieutenant Richard Dormer, head of the task force on catching this guy they dubbed the railroad rapist because everybody he was raping uh, came off a railroad train in Long Island on their way to where they parked their um, car and that's where he would get them. and. This detective was so kind that when they had this big press conference, because this was big deal news. I mean, this guy was big deal news, and they had a press conference, and he said, you know, we, we couldn't have done it without this young guy who did some hypnosis and helped us. And all of a sudden, the phone was ringing off the hook. You couldn't buy that kind of advertising. And so I was, I, I felt like I did something useful there and 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 they then started calling me for all kinds of things and bringing all kinds of people in and it was a a, a very exciting um time of my life to be working with i was always alone and there i am with these police officers and, and being treated kind of like i'm one of the crowd uh, and they, um, they flew me, they, they had a gal, this was on Long Island, who was shot and killed when she was sitting in her living room with her children. Um, and this detective wanted me to fly to this other state and talk to this fellow that they think might have sold the weapon to the guy they thought did it who was her ex-husband, and I flew out there and I talked with him and I did everything I could. I spent an hour and a half 
and I completely dead-ended, screwed up. I couldn't get anywhere. I mean, nowhere. This detective was enraged. He's driving me back to the airport like an angry 16-year-old. And, and I said, uh, so the, 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 the detective, sir, <laughs> was he married? Is he married? And he said, yeah, so what? I said, well, I'd like to meet his wife. And the detective says, well, his wife didn't sell him the freaking gun. And I said, well, but couldn't I just meet her? He said, why? And I said, because I flew out to another whole state to work on a homicide case, and I'm here. Bring me to his wife. He did. Everything worked perfect. I mean, perfect, unbelievably perfect. She, she says, well, I, I, I don't know. I don't remember him. I don't like guns. And I said, okay, well, let's do this little hypnotic thing. And then I said, so what about that day? She says, oh, okay. He, I, I see him walking up the front walk. He drove, he drove in this kind of car with an MGB and he's in and he has a British accent and this is what he's wearing. And he's walking into the house. The detective who hated my guts five minutes before is like, ah, 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 yes, yes, yes. And then I did something that never works. I said, would you just do me a favor, look out the window and read off the numbers on the license plate? And she did, and he wrote them down and they caught the bad guy and um, he went to prison. So I was kind of instrumental in getting um, to, to help get this rapist off the streets and, and, and this homicidal guy who killed his wife while she's playing with her children in the living room, you know? You gotta be against that. Um, and so that got me interested in, you know, what can we do to really make a difference for people who have been um, significantly harmed, traumatized? And 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 I I tried to, you know I, I I just did everything the opposite of how they taught me. Wow! So this is all through hypnotherapy. Is that what the rapid resolution therapy is? Is it is it's a form of hypnotherapy? We don't use the word usually. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we don't. The problem with saying hypnosis is you spend fifteen minutes telling people it's not what they think it is. Not a good way to start a relationship. Well, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, and nothing you think is true. So uh, usually I don't say anything about that, but we are uh, sometimes saying things about it, particularly to professionals I'm training. So I began doing training programs in clinical hypnosis and then clinical hypnosis and trauma resolution, and now clinical hypnosis and rapid resolution therapy. In fact, I'm starting one in um in, in just about a week um, amazing so so so, so one with if, going back to the story about the lady that was right but she couldn't recall it is, is that because of what the brain does when we're in i don't kind have of... any clue okay yeah um you know I appreciate you asking me all these questions, but let me stop you a moment and, and say, I am like so excited to be with you and so impressed with you. And I listen to you inspire people right and left and the way that you bring people out. And I hear that when you do that with others. And I'm thinking, how the heck did she do that? Because interviewers, God love them, but they, they they're often get, they get in the way. You know, um, and they want to talk about all this stuff or ask all these things. And, and, and you ask brilliant questions and then shut up. And I, I was listening to that and saying, wow, she's good at this. You get right to it. And then you know how to actually listen. So, Thank so you. I'm excited to be with you. I think you're changing lives phenomenally and all over the world. Thank you so much, John. My head's going to get so big now. I don't think I'll be able to walk out of my office today. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for that. Let's, let's go into uh, your book, uh, Grief is Not Sacred. 
I'd love to unpack that a little bit because I a statement that I've got here is grief has nothing to do with love. I'd love to learn more about that. I've written two books that are out there, Catherine. Yes. The first one I did a while back is called Life-Changing Conversations. If I can spend a moment on that one, I'll go right to the next one, promise. What Life-Changing Conversations is about is that you can change somebody's life in a wonderful way in a single conversation. Um, so the first story in that book is about uh, this young lady I saw. Um, her, her, I, I still remember her father calls me and says, um, hey, um, my friend suggested I bring my daughter to you. And I said, well, tell me about her. And he said, well, she has five or six or seven seizures a day. She wears a helmet on her head so she doesn't bash her head in on something. She can't w watch television. She can't go out. She can't go to stores. She's either with a three-pronged cane or, or a wheelchair. And she's seen all of these psychologists and been treated at this top clinic um, here, here in the States with top medical people, top psychologists. And he said, John, um, I, I, I want to bring her to you. I learned later it, it was from some guy I helped quit smoking. I mean, so it had nothing to do with how to deal with this. And I said, wow, I, I understand. And I'm sorry, I won't see her. And he said, what do you mean you won't see her? And I said, how are you going to get her to me? I mean, she doesn't live anywhere around here. She can't fly. She can't take a train. He said, well, I'm going to go and drive her 16 hours. I said, yeah, you drive her 16 hours to me. And nobody's been able to help her. You know, I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to be able to. I might not be able to do a damn thing. It's likely nobody else has. And then what? What do you say to her 16 hour trip and she spends time with this guy that's supposed to be able to do something and 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 i don't get anywhere i was intimidated you know and and, he, and, and the guy starts crying um and, and says i'm going to carry her to you on my back i'll do anything i have to do you have to see her go, oh lord give me a break anyway i said yes he came her name was Kristen. She came with her dad. They pull up in front of the house and she said, Daddy, I'm going to go in without this stuff. And she left her helmet and she left the she left the cane. She left the whole thing. And she managed to walk in. And we spent, I don't know, an hour and a half. Um, and it was amazing. And she never had another seizure and went and did a TED talk and has a couple of million views and um it was like it was like amazing and exciting and she's become a wonderful healer uh and 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 does things for for other people because we got her into training how to how to do this for others so the first book life-changing conversations is all verbatim conversations that i had with people where they told me it was a life changer. It was a game changer. Things were completely different afterwards than they were um, before. And blah, blah, blah. But now I'm going to be courteous and answer your question, which I haven't up till now, and say, grief is not sacred. Here's what I got interested in. I started looking at, at the descriptions of all of these books on grief. And and I'm sure they're all different, but they all seem to, in the description, say the same thing, which is, if you're grieving, you need to do that, and it's really okay that you're not okay. And people might tell you that it's not okay for you to not be okay, but it is okay for you to not be okay. And, and the fact that you feel crappy is a testament to 
that you're a loving, feeling, caring human being. It's all right to not be all right. And I looked at that and I said, well, sure as hell ain't all right with me um, for people to not be all right. That gal, by the way, I was just telling you about, that was grief um, that uh, um, had to do with her sister being um, run over with a, a drunk driver. Um, and, and, and that's what caused all the seizures and all the other stuff. So I thought, people don't have to it, it's like everything I learned in school. And then when I was learning for, uh, around the grief treatment, it seems to me that the mental health industry seems to say that the reason people feel bad is because they haven't been feeling bad enough. That's certainly what they said to me. So when I was trying to learn how to deal with trauma, I, I learned how to be good at getting people to feel miserable. And I guess somebody might have gotten better, but it was sure as hell in spite of me. Not, not because of me. And then I took another whole entire look at it that was basically, people say, how do you learn to do what you came up with? And I said, I just tried to remember everything they taught me and do the opposite. And so grief is not sacred, um, is again demonstrating how people can overcome um, debilitating grief, pathological grief. I just met with a gal a couple hours before meeting with you uh, from Australia. It was, it was exciting. And she'd been grieving for seven years after her beloved um, mother passed from uh, cancer uh, up until today. And now she's not. I mean, she's totally not. Um, and that's what the book Grief is Not Sacred is, is designed to um, teach people how to do for others and benefit from themselves. We've got another one in the works. It's going to take a while to come out, but it's a comic book on grief. We need more comic books on grief. I'm curious, why comic books? Oh, because I like to look at pictures and see colors. Okay. And I met this amazing artist and she said, she said, what do you want to do next? And, and uh, I said, well, maybe something else on grief. I said, you know, that was a pretty heavy book I just wrote. She said, what do you want to do next? And I jokingly said, a comic book? Next thing I know, she's sending me all this amazing artwork. And I say, oh, Good Lord, I'm writing a comic book about grief. And, and we're writing a comic book about grief. And it's designed to read the comic and get over the grief because you don't have a right to feel crappy on my watch. We want you feeling good. And so does the person who you love. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So, and it's one of those things that uh, I find that people either don't want to admit to if they're feeling it or don't want to experience it. And it's, it's, it's one of those things that I hear quite often. We've even had some guests on the show that talk about the, the, and there seems to be a lot of it. I don't know about you, John, if you're seeing it, but there's a lot of, a lot more talk about grief and trauma and, you know, who's really uh, leading your life. Is it really truly you or is it your trauma self? Uh, is it really your grief that you haven't expressed or is it really your your lighter self or your... your, your yeah, your... I hate that stuff, Catherine. Mm. Because all of those questions are designed to get people to be introspective and figure themselves out. And people who go to therapy are generally bright people who are trying to figure themselves out anyway. And if they haven't been, they go to some the psychotherapist who encourages them to try to figure themselves out. And, and what I tell people is introspection, self-analysis, trying to figure yourself out is what people do when they're screwed up. Nobody does that when they're having a good day. I mean, if you're playing great tennis, if you're skiing down a hill, if you're having amazing sex, or you're trying to figure out, I wonder what my mother might have done that caused me to be here. 
We only do that when we feel crappy. And what's happened is people seem to be prescribing the symptom of being screwed up as the solution to being screwed up. And I think it causes people to just dig into deeper and deeper holes. And I think uh, people in the mental health industry and even the coaching industry and metaphysical industry are really good at telling people they need to be able to do things that nobody actually has to be able to do. And if you can convince somebody that in order to do what they want to do, they have to do something that's incredibly hard to do, you can really screw them up. Like, I want to go from New Jersey to New York City. Okay, well, you have to first go to Australia to get between them. You don't. Um, and 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 there's so much of that out there. Like, I, I have to love myself. I have to forgive people. Um, um, I, I have to have confidence. Um, and I think it's all crap. So are you saying that um, I'm trying I'm trying to contextualize it here. So are you saying that um, when something comes up, so let's say, and it's true, I agree with what you're saying, you, you don't do a self inquiry or do a deep dive into your psyche unless you're actually experiencing something. So I do agree with you because if you're on a high and you're having a great time, you don't assess that. But it's only right. when you're feeling a bit stuck uh, that then you will look, okay, so what's going on here? And you start doing this deep inquiry. So what and you're saying- the smarter you are, the deeper it gets. Sorry? And the smarter you are, the deeper it gets. Oh, I I, I uh, can relate to that one, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So this is- a a hole that really intelligent, cool people fall into, I think. Yeah. So what do we do then, John? What, what's your, what would be your recommendation? Because I do, I have to say that I go deep, absolutely. But I find that I, so I don't go, I don't looking, I don't go looking for the why. I go looking for what is it that I'm experiencing right now? what's getting in my way, what's bubbling up. I don't try to find the the root cause of it because sometimes I think that- Did that, you say you do or don't? I, I don't. Didn't hear. No, I don't. Don't. Okay. Well, that's no. a start. Yay. Purely because I think that sometimes you can, you can go searching and searching and searching and never find the root cause. You spent 20 years on it. Yeah. There, there was a film that Woody Allen was in a long time ago. It was called Sleeper. Um, and he, he goes to sleep and he wakes up like a hundred years in the future. And I remember this one line where he said, if I had just stayed in therapy, I might be almost done. <laughs> hundred years later. So yeah, I, I I don't see it as the quickest line between two points. I think mm. it's really lucrative for people in the mental health industry because they get to get paid over and over and over and over again while taking no freaking responsibility for anything. Yeah. It's interesting because I, I actually, I have a coaching academy um, and we actually, when I facilitate, I talk about the difference between um, the, you know, if somebody goes to a psychologist or a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist, they go back in time and they, they do go down the rabbit hole to identify whatever you're experiencing. Whereas coaching is a very different, it's looking forward in time, not back in time. You can go back in time to, um, uh, uh, you know, like grab some resources. Let's say um, so if somebody said, look, I'm um, finding it really hard to be confident, then you could say, can you recall a time where you felt really confident? So you can go back to a time to grab those resources, but not so much go back in time to identify the root cause or why this is taking place. And I feel yeah, that well, that's, I feel very aligned with what you're saying. Booming. I mean, you guys are booming. Yes. Um, because people would like to be able to actually have their lives work better rather than get a degree and why they're screwed up. Yeah. So I applaud what you're saying for sure. Yeah, I feel aligned with what you're saying. That's why I'm, I'm bringing it up because it is very aligned with it's actually looking at your current state, your present state, because I think that, you know, I always say we are walking, talking programs and patterns and conditionings of whatever uh, has taken place over our time, however old you are, does it really matter? But we have 
got all these programs and it's about becoming more conscious about the way that we go about life. Is it is it really our patterns playing out here or is it uh, our consciousness being present in the now creating something completely brilliant and new? What do I you think about see, that? I, I see how it would have value, but it's not how I do it. Um, I want to... I want to get it fixed from outside in, but inside out at the same time, so that the shift is effortless. One of the things that's different about what I teach people to do and what's out there in the in the mental health industry and in the educational industry um, is that people in the educational industry constantly blame the people that they fail people in the mental health industry constantly blame the people that they fail. When did you last speak to somebody with a license in a mental health discipline who said to you, Catherine, I worked with somebody yesterday and I didn't get them better because I don't didn't have the skill to do it. I never heard that, not once from any of them. It's because she was resistant, because she wasn't ready to change. It's because she didn't care. It was because she wasn't motivated. And the other group that does that is the educational system, who instead of looking to inspire kids and move them forward, bribes them or disgraces them in order to control them. Bribes, disgraces, ostracizes, banishes, um, and, and since it's mandatory that every asshole has a gun in the United States, of course, these people that are um, ostracized and thrown out come back with their new submachine gun and blow everybody away. Um, but you don't get teachers saying, my student fell asleep in my class. I guess I'm not very interesting. Um, gal called me, Catherine, the other day. She works at a donut place. She's got three children, no husband, works in a donut place, works extra shifts to work in a donut place. She was upset. The um, assistant principal of this big school called her up and said, we found your 14-year-old son smoking in the bathroom. You have to do something about that. She called me and said, what can I do? I'm doing everything I can. I said, wait two days, call the principal and say, my son didn't help with the dishes last night. Fix that. I mean, you've got a principal, an assistant principal, three psychologists, six social workers, 12 guidance counselors, and everybody else has a master's in education. Don't dump it on some poor lady that works at a donut shop to fix it that you can't run your own place. So you can tell I have some some passion about that, but it it disturbs me that people are falling through the cracks, and the only thing we get from those organizations is it's their own fault. It's like taking your car in for body work. They take the money, they keep it for a month. When you come back, it's just the same, and they say, oh, sorry, Catherine, your car wasn't ready to change. That is so true well, when you put it like that. that? What's that? It's so true when you put it like that, because I remember before we got on the show, we were talking about, um, I think one of the things that, that a statement was, there are no resistant clients, only unskilled coaches and therapists, which is what you're well, talking about. Well, yeah. I mean, why this whole notion, I'm going to come to you, I'm going to make an appointment, I'm going to spend my time with you, I'm going to pay you because I want to screw it up and not get better, ha ha, on you. Who's doing that? It's If somebody is in front of me and interested in getting their lives better, I tell you right up front, it's my job to get you better, not your own. And if I don't do it, I screwed it up. And if I screwed it up, it's because I'm not skillful enough, but I'll damn well find somebody who is. Um, I love that. But you don't hear that much, do you? No, 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 you don't. And um, But the thing is, I guess, even for myself, if from my experience, if I'm not able to help someone, I'll, I'll do that. I will say that I think there might be somebody else better for you. 
and and I would recommend somebody that we could could assist them if I feel a level of resistance I don't go the resistance comes from the coachee it's it's me it's my it's what I'm doing that they're not aligned with I I think that gives you tremendous extra power responsibility provides power mm. um uh, power causes responsibility i mean they go hand in hand if, if if you're in an elevator and you're a cardiologist and the person seems to have a heart attack i think you have some responsibility if you're a poet not so much um uh, and so i think it's it's a really good idea for those of us who are dealing with coaching or mental health or any kind of people change business, including metaphysics, which is a whole other thing that's out there blaming people for not getting better. I mean, in a woo-woo spiritual sort of way, but still blaming people for not getting better. Oh, you were resistant. You didn't accept their path or something or listen to your guide. How about I screwed it up for you. I didn't have the skill. I apologize. You're a cool person. Let's find somebody that knows what they're doing for you. I apparently didn't. I love that. And that takes a lot of courage to be that accountable too, because it's so easy to blame others. I think so. And mm. and we don't blame ourselves because I, if I don't have the skill, I didn't have it. It's not because I didn't care. I just say I didn't have it. It's like I didn't have the height. It mm. just is. Yeah. Um, and I look to acquire it. But I don't look to, I mean, think of what they do in school. Mm. They, they, they don't try to make what they're saying interesting. They blame the student for falling asleep. I bet you've done some public speaking. If you're doing public speaking and the audience is falling asleep, do you write to their parents? You <laughs> know, I, I, I'm actually, I do a lot of public speaking. And if I start feeling the energy uh, maybe uh, um, uh, starting to, and you can see people might, the way they're sitting, you can read their physiology. Then oh, yeah. I read the energy of the room Then I need to, you know, ramp it up a bit. I need to speed ramp things up. up. I need to, yeah. So I take full accountability. I don't yeah, think, that, oh my so gosh, that's so wonderful. falling asleep. That's so wonderful. That makes you a much better speaker, gives you power, gives you responsibility. And if you see somebody falling asleep, you talk louder. Mm. rather than say oh you're resistant not ready for change sleepy lazy unhelpable asshole <laughs> john this another thing that you you actually uh another statement motivation doesn't exist talk me through that well i think they've done a lot of autopsies and never found any um so what we teach is 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 this or what I, what i teach is this that my intention for you is that your mind entertain only what will be good to have done and possible to do and to and then i want your mind to cause that to be interesting and then as you begin doing it to be pleasurable, and then as you're wrapping it up to cause satisfaction. So if I'm home and I see um, an apple and I see donuts, I would like my mind to not be interested in donuts because donuts have proven to not be my friend. So I'd like my mind to show me, wow, there's an apple and I could actually eat it and it will be good to have eaten it. And it will be interesting to see what it's like. And boy, it's satisfying to have eaten it. And then you're doing stuff. You don't need motivation. Just set it up like that. We don't expect people to set it up that way by themselves. We believe it's our job as RRT facilitators to set it up that way for them so that the um so that the mind is working in a way that causes satisfaction making things better for that person and then the whole world um 
So, so you're, what you're saying is you are training the brain to be more like interested in something else, right? So, so moving your attention away from the donuts, for example, and moving your attention towards the apple and, and, and build an interest towards the apple to a yeah. level of satisfaction. Yeah. Get the, get those things that will be good to have done to be interesting to do. Like when I was um, go going through a whole lot of my early life, um, if you said, why don't you go work out? I would say, well, you know, you mean just lift things up and that'll make my arms sore. That doesn't sound very interesting. I was a kid picked last in gym class. And when the teacher wasn't there, they picked the girls first. Um, and, and I know now that would make sense, but back then well, it wasn't supposed to be happening that they picked the girls before the boys in gym class. That happened to me. Talk about freaking trauma. I don't need to relive that. I need to take a breath and think, goodness, that isn't there any longer. And now my mind highlights what would be good to have done. So I know it will be good to have done a conversation with you. And so I get excited and interested about doing it. Um, and then as I'm doing it, my mind is causing it to be super fun for me. And then when we get it done, I'm going to go yay and feel really satisfied. And it's not because um, uh, that came with me. That's not an attribute. That's not my height. That's all stuff we can shift and change for other people um and 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 this whole notion that you're supposed to come to me pay me while well, your job is to make your own self better um and that, that that reminds me of going to get my hair cut and the gal comes over smiles and hands me scissors you know, yeah cut my freaking hair if you're going to charge me I love your analogies. It's amazing. One other thing too that uh, uh, stood out for me in some of your statements, empathy is disrespectful. Talk me through that one. You say, oh, I've been worried about this. And I go, oh, Catherine, I really feel you. That's empathy. I really feel you. How can I feel you? I'm feeling me and thinking it's you. So what, 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 when... When we're taught to understand other people by feeling our own emotions and saying, you know, oh, I get what's going on for you. Oh, I really get it. I mean, I didn't begin this way, Catherine. I thought my job was to feel it more than you feel it. I wanted to cry while you cried. I thought if I could just feel bad enough, you'd feel better. Until I watched this Star Trek version where they had this empath. And somebody was unhappy, she was really unhappy. Somebody was sick, she got much sicker. Then somebody was really sick and she was dead. And I said, you know what? This empathy thing, I think I want to get on a different pony than that. So, so I think they, empathy so is disrespectful because I think it's disrespectful for me to tell you that I get you yeah. by my own experience. My own experience means I get me. Mm. If I want to get you, I better listen to you not feel it inside myself. So I guess it's even the same. I'm, I'm, I'm connecting with, I understand. You know, when someone tells you, hey, I've experienced blah, 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 and then you go, I understand. How could you truly understand when you actually haven't been through it yourself? So it's something similar. What about empaths? Because I'm a massive empath. So am I being disrespectful that I'm picking up and I literally pick up things off people? If I'm facilitating, oh, somebody's got a headache. I don't think you can do anything long, wrong. I just love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what about so you ain't getting me telling you that you're disrespectful try something else i'm not going to say that to you i think you're respectful kind i think you have some innate thing that causes people to flourish and i think you're changing the world oh thank you but i am an empath i do pick up on other people's stuff and then i'll walk away after I facilitate with a headache knowing that somebody else had a headache or i can actually physically feel people's pain if you can use that in a way that is going to make you more powerful. I mean, I sort of do that too, but I'm teaching people that the respectful way to understand somebody else 
is to listen just like you are when you're talking to me. And just like you would be when you're listening to somebody else, you listen, you don't say, oh, I get it. When what you're really getting is yourself. Now you have sort of a, also kind of a, a, a psychic thing going on where you're getting not just yourself, but that other person. And that works for you. And I'm sure it works for the people that are lucky enough to spend time with you. But I don't think that's what's usually going on when people think they're being empathic. I feel you, baby. Yeah, I love, <laughs> I love that you say that. I feel you, baby. It's so true. I love it. Absolutely love it. Um, there was one thing too, p telling people they need to love themselves or forgive themselves is cruel. Well, yeah. I mean, who does that? I mean, there's Eagle and man, she is really hungry and she's flying up there and she's looking down and there's this nice fat rabbit. And she says, oh, well, first I got to do some loving on myself and then I'm going to go get that thing. And by the time she's done loving herself, there's no rabbit. I mean, the, the, when people say, I hate myself, they don't even know what their self is. What they hate is, I hate how I've been feeling. I don't have to love how I've been feeling, but I think that's me. So when we tell people, love yourself, they, they well, well, who do they think their selves even are? What they've been feeling, what they've been doing, or the shape of their ass. Um, and, and none of those are yourself anyway. And so it's not about trying to love what you hate, which is what people get when you hear you have to love yourself. It's not about loving what you hate. It's about shifting things so that you are enjoying things that will be good to have done. And that's all you have to do. You don't have to sit and love yourself first. I tell people in my class, if you're going to be loving yourself during my class, please excuse yourself and do it in private. <laughs> I love that. And, you know, they, I have to say, John, I have not come across that. I've quite often I hear it, it, it's how can you love somebody outside of you if you don't love yourself? How can Easily. you share your heart when I you love can't... you much more than I love me? Easily. Yeah. Yeah, same. I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I do that. I love other people a lot more than I love me. Well, I think that's wonderful. You want to be around people that say, you know, I love myself a whole lot more than I like you. I don't want that. I'm glad to be with you. You like me better than you like you. I like you better than I like me. I mean, I'm out. This stuff directs people in, like inside is the solution. I've consulted with all these substance abuse treatment facilities. They get people sitting around in groups talking about how much, how bad their parents were, uh, how their mothers are fault. And oh boy, we blame mothers for everything. If they turn their back, then they're disregarding and abandoning. And if they move close, then they're enabling. I mean, I, I've seen so many mothers of people who are caught in addiction being tortured by the asinine substance abuse industry, which absolutely never takes responsibility for anything. But just, I mean, they're better at, 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 at blaming everybody else even than the mental health idiots, I think. Um, please go ahead. So, so what I'm understanding is you work external. So you externalize it for them to work with, not internalize it. Is that right? I think the solution is to be out, not in. Okay. I think if you're going to help people overcome being addicted to methamphetamine, you might tell them to go out and milk cows and brush horses, not sit around in groups complaining about their mothers. Yeah. I love your analogy, John. It's, it's, it makes me um, giggle. Just some of the things you've come up with is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And it's true. It's very similar to what we do when sometimes when people can't connect with what is going on, like from, from, you know, whatever's bubbling up for, for them or an experience that they're experiencing is to externalize it. And so it's almost like creating an external persona to work with. So, um, and I'm not, I don't really know what rapid resolution therapy is. I think I'm going to have to do your course to understand what it is, but it's. Oh, I would so love to have you. Are you kidding me? 
Um, I would love it. One is starting soon, and, 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 and I would love you. So here, for instance, here's a piece of it. I teach people that rabbits, we don't want rabbits distracted by carrots when they're running from foxes. The mind of the rabbit causes the information about the fox to increase. So I call you up and say, Catherine, I'm all upset. And you say, what's the matter now, John? I say, well, the sky is all blue and there are these white clouds. You say, well, sweetheart, why is this so upsetting to you? And I say, because someone's stolen the stars. And you say, no, honey, they haven't stolen the stars. The sun's coming in big, so you can't see the stars. And, and that's good because fox is coming in big, rabbit's not distracted by carrots. But after rabbit is safe, and you say, hey, rabbit, I'm so glad you're OK. I mean, damn, did you see the size of that fox? Rabbit says, Catherine, what fox? Because they're not storing information. They don't sit and reminisce. Our minds look to store information. And when the information has expanded, and then our, our minds add meaning to things, and a lot of people want meaningful lives. I'm trying to get a meaningless life happening for me because I'd like to see what's actually there instead of some color that my mind attaches to it. I want to see the, the real thing. Um, but this glop of data about the trauma doesn't get processed and is being read as if it's still taking place. I was, I was with this guy and he pulls out this photograph and he looks nervous and puts it back in his pocket. A half hour later, he did it again. The third time I did it, I said, what the hell is that a picture of? And he says, look, and it was a rhinoceros charging. I said, well, what do you keep checking it for? He says, I, I, I want to know whether it's going to stop charging. I said, dude, it isn't a freaking rhinoceros. Rhinoceroses aren't three inches tall and they're not flat. That's how a rhinoceros looked through a distorted lens from a particular angle at a particular moment. And when somebody is recalling or being continuing to be troubled because of experience that they had as a rape, the mind is reading the thing as if it's still happening, about to happen, just happened, all at the same time. And the solution isn't to convince them it is happening so they can sob and vomit, like, forgive me, I used to do, um, because that's what they taught me. The thing is to give that gal the good news that if you have a pulse, you won. Because the job, the job while being raped is to not be dead when it's finished. And so every man, every woman who went through something like that and has a pulse is a hero. And you know how you see in this country, sometimes you see license plates that say like former prisoner of war and stuff like that. I'm trying to get the motor vehicle department to put out license plates that say I was raped. I was gang raped. I'm alive and I'm proud of it we got to get rid of shame and yeah. and 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 what what's exciting to me about um some of what i see in the community that i'm part of is people are stepping into what they used to call vulnerability self disclosure but in our community it's called stepping into power because when I can tell you, yeah, I did get picked last in gym class, and the girls got picked first, every one of them, except for one that I think was disabled. I mean, but I feel powerful being able to reveal the real thing. And, and I find that in our culture, the answer to how you're doing is always fine, other than lately, now it's become awesome. This guy, I said to him, how are you doing? He says, awesome. I asked him a couple of days later, awesome. Then one day he finally said, awesome. Why do you have to ask? 
I'm awesome. How are you? I said, I'm depressed. And he said, depressed? What could you be depressed about? I said, I'm depressed about you being awesome. But the hell wants to hear somebody who's awesome 24-7? I'm lucky, Catherine, because people that everybody wants to be come to me, and they don't want to be themselves. They feel freaking miserable. But if you look on social media, all they experience is various shades of ecstasy. So it's gone from fine, fine, fine to incredible ecstasy. I took a gal to lunch. I started to dig in. It looked great. She said, stop. I said, oh my God, I've done something really wrong. I said, what, what did I do? She said, you're going to just start eating? I said, well, I'm sorry. And then she grabbed her camera and starts taking all these pictures of the food that can go out, pictures of food. I'm having an amazing time having dinner at this fancy restaurant. Good grief. She wasn't that happy. I wasn't that happy. We weren't that happy with each other, but you could never tell it from her Instagram page. So, so true. All these people feeling good is depressing to me. Mm. Yeah, and it and it's 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 false. I mean, I I'm not a big fan of social media. Everyone knows that, but it's it is one of those things that I think that people look into and then want to be like that, and then they think there's something wrong with them if they're feeling flat or they're feeling down or they're not you know happy or you know. And I think that uh, it's okay to be and feel whatever you're experiencing, not good or bad. It just is. And, and say it authentically, so not so yeah. the rest of us don't feel we're the only person feeling bad. Yeah. I was in a restaurant recently. Gal came over. Um, my coffee cup was almost empty. Here they give you free refills, you know. And, and so she walks over and looks at me with the empty coffee cup, and she said, how are you doing? And I said, uh-oh, lady, you're going to get it. And I said, ma'am, I am so glad you've asked. I've been wanting to tell somebody all day. You see, I went to the dentist earlier and I thought it was just going to be an easy thing. And you know what? She tells me I have to do all this stuff. It's going to hurt and cost a lot of money. And I see the lady with the coffee pot backing up, faces white, horrified. Finally, she says, stop. And I said, what, what, what? And she says, I don't really want to know how you are. I, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I just meant, do you want coffee? So, well, then freaking say that. Yes, I definitely want some coffee. By the way, how are you? Because <laughs> you don't want to know how I am. That is that is so true, and that is that is a, that's it just puts it into perspective, doesn't it? Really, when and it's just automatic. People just say, "How are you?" and they don't really mean, "How are you?" Where they want to find out. It's just a. It's one of like it's when somebody says, "How are you feeling?" Fine, 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 but it's. They're not really feeling fine. I tell people I'm training, don't open by saying, how are you? You might as well say, start being inauthentic and we'll work from there. Yeah. So don't use those words. I, I, I love what I'm able to do, which is teach people how to use these processes and get other people better. When I began, we only let people with a mental health license in the room. And I did that for years and years and years and years till I started noticing all the people with mental health license were, were saying to me, the hardest part about learning from you is trying to not, not be affected by the junk I learned when I was in counselor school or social work school. And they convinced me, why don't you let people in who don't have all this baggage? And so we started getting people who want to be coaches and they haven't had all that background and and we get people who are psychologists and psychiatrists taking the training but i get people who who just say i want to learn this so i can make my own life better make the people around me have a better life nobody's taught how to be good to anybody my friend died when i was in 11th grade i avoided him because i didn't nobody taught me what i was supposed to say to somebody who's father died. I, I, I was only taught how to spell guts of worms and dumb mm -hmm. stuff. And, yeah. and I can say the same thing went through with college and then graduate school and all the way through. Nobody has, I don't remember any class where they told me, what are you supposed to say to somebody who's 
parents just got killed. What are you supposed to say when your daughter just didn't get on the cheerleading team? What do you do when people are hurting? And my mission is to end human suffering and teach other people how they can do that also. And some of them make a damn good living doing it. And others just like doing it for people they care about. And we have that whole mix together and then have formed a community where, where people are, are, are really there for each other, really there for each other. That's beautiful. Um, with really skill. beautiful. Thank you, dear. And we will have all that in the show notes. I am conscious of your time, John. So the way that we wrap up the shows, we always love to ask our special guest uh, to leave three <laughs> shiny golden nuggets for our viewers and listeners. And for our viewers and listeners, we will have everything in the show notes. Uh, and also you'll be able to look into the rapid resolution therapy courses that John uh, office, which I'm going to look into myself after this. Um, but Thank over you. to wow, you. Wow, that is such a compliment. You're such a sweetheart. We have one thing. We have a group every week that's free where people just come and talk about what's been bothering them, and we do what we can to fix it fast. That's the shallow end of the pool. Then we have deeper courses for people looking to learn to do this stuff. Beautiful. We have a nonprofit because we want to be able to provide services to people who have been traumatized and don't have resources. That's beautiful, um, John. Nuggets. I didn't forget. Nuggets. No. Um, I think it's useful for people to have an understanding of stucknesses and then perhaps can unravel some of their own stucknesses. One stuckness that I see almost every time I meet somebody who's stuck is, it sounds like this, you know, I'll tell you about me, I, I, I'm lonely, but I can't really connect with people. I mean, I can't start conversations. I, 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 I just, uh, I'll get so awkward, even if you come to talk to me, much less me try to talk to you. That stuckness we call disappearing present, because there's no present. The person is describing his past in future tense. And if you're describing your past in future tense, you're screwed because your mind is listening to you as you talk about how bad your future is going to be. So that's something we listen for. We don't confront people on it, but we fix it so it's no longer happening. Um, what's another one? Um, negation. Almost everybody who's stuck comes to me and tells me the way they don't want to feel, the way they don't want to think, and what they don't want to do. I don't want to have this anxiety. I don't want to get nervous when I talk to people. I don't want to get really angry. I don't want to blame everybody. I don't want to be an asshole. Um, but I believe our unconscious mind doesn't understand negation. And if I say to you, Hey, Catherine, I bet there's something that you've been successful with your entire life that I could cause you to be a failure with. But wouldn't you think if you could do it your whole life, you could do it for 10 more seconds? Most people say, of course I could. And I say, good. Then oh, I went, let's do five seconds. I don't want to take advantage of you. Just don't think of a red-tailed mermaid on a trapeze. Ah, that's not fair. You made me think of it. Well, that's what you've been doing. You've been doing all this stuff. And it doesn't mean negative the way people mean it in terms of critical or complaining. It just means a negation. Um, an another one is jealousy. Um, you know, I'm driving along and I see some guy in a Rolls Royce and a, or a Bentley. I might be thinking, gosh, I'd like to be that guy. I want that. Well, okay, John, you can have that, but you got to also have his wife and his children and his body and the whole freaking thing, and you have people coming to you who have Rolls Royces and they're freaking miserable. So do you want to take the chance? No, I don't. Thank you. I don't want to be jealous anymore. So we get rid of that. We find bunches of those stucknesses. We've got lists of them. And as people get to um, understand them, they, 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 they can bust free from the freaking thing. And uh, and another stuckness, which you teased out of me before, 
is is the whole idea that I have to do things I don't actually have to do in order to finally get better, like forgive people, love myself, like myself, and become confident. You don't have to be confident. I haven't been one bit confident since I've been with you. I've been out, I'm focused, but I'm not thinking, oh, I'm good at this. I feel pretty good about myself here. I mean, not one thought of it, and I wouldn't want it. It would be a big distraction. So true. So true. I love it. I could keep you on the show for hours, John. It's been amazing to have you on the show. Where is the best place for our family to find you? Well, the, the two books are available now on Amazon, um, Life-Changing Conversations, where you'll hear word for word what was said to that gal so she no longer has seizures and does TED Talks, or Grief is Not Sacred, and we have them priced super low um, because I'm not thinking I'm going to be making money with books anyway. I just want to get them out there for people to um, be reading that. The website is rapidresolutiontherapy.com. And if you go to that website, um, um, there are lots of free resources. There's the ability to take free things like the solutions group I do every week, um, 7 p.m. Eastern time. I don't know what that is for you guys, um, uh, but you're all being heard all over the world anyway. Um, and, and, and all kinds of uh, courses that prepare people to sometimes have a really lucrative career, causing other people to have much better lives. I'll tell you, it sure beats working for a living. That's amazing. That's amazing. You're doing great work. Keep doing what you're doing. We'll have all of that in the show notes. John, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing your you're, wealth you're just of such wisdom. A delightful person. I'm I'm excited. I love this. Can we do it again tomorrow? I'd love to have you back on the show. You <laughs> could have I could I could talk to you all day long. And the thing is, I like the way that you think, the way that you explain things and some of your stories and your analogies, it makes so much sense. So thank and you. You make sense to me too. Thanks for the wonderful work you're doing for people. Thank you so much, John. Thank you.